welcome to another episode of Carolyn Talks Television. I'm Carolyn Topol, and I'm here with my fabulous co-host, Rachel Arnett. Hey, guys. And today we're continuing the second to last in our series of family viewing through the decades. I'm going to miss it. It has been kind of fun, <laughs> and you're going to miss it because actually, as of today, Rachel is really part of the family team. We're, we're finally in the pocket of the years in which I was alive to watch these shows. Not only live, but remember. But remember, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. The so 80s, she was, was alive, alive but, but, you know, yeah, but people who are still taking naps and sucking their thumb just don't remember those. No, I have no recollection. No. <laughs> so now we're going to hit the big... 1990s, but first, as promised, yes. I just want to recap. We talked about the Emmys. Mm -hmm. Gave Bec our predictions for the big categories. That's right. And lo and behold, some of our predictions actually came true. And our hopes and wishes, too, which is yeah, nice. Some of, yeah, some of them. Yeah. Some of them, not so much. No. Um, I know the hopes and wishes of network television were yeah. not met because, yeah. oh boy, regular network TV, big, big. No votes, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, my personal love of This Is Us, <laughs> clearly not shared by the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Well, and it's, it's interesting because I feel like the critical response to This Is Us is either they love it or they think it's so, like nighttime soap opera, which is kind but of- But that's okay. Which is okay and frankly still phenomenal performances. But the showrunner's previous show, Parenthood, I felt had the same reaction. Where Parenthood on TV had some of the most incredible performances I've ever seen, but they were never really taken seriously for awards in and, the way and, that I felt and, they should have. And for the quality that they, they give, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't get it. But like we predicted, <laughs> Game of Thrones yep. took so many categories. I'm not even naming them all, but it started with best drama, what a surprise. Mm -hmm. And look, we knew it was going to be the sentimental favorite. Mm -hmm. It had a huge following. It was quality. It was creative. It was original and mm -hmm. had, a, you know, it's wonderful surprise endings. I'm not going to spoil anything for anybody who still hasn't watched it. If you haven't, where are you? <laughs> um, <laughs> they've been in the cave. <laughs> oh, okay. Waiting. They've been, yeah, they've been in their man and woman cave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> waiting for the TV to get installed. Yeah. <laughs> or the internet. Um, it, it was, it's, it's just very interesting because I feel like the critical reception was a lot better than the fan reception and s of the season. Like th there are some critical statements to the negative, but it's, it's usually there seems to be a divide kind of in the other direction where fans love a show, but it's not getting nominated. This time around the show got really well nominated and won and the fans were like, Pff. except Peter Dinklage, he wins every award ever. For anything, I would vote for him for president. I would. There you go. There you go. Peter Dinklage, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for best comedy, it's a show I never actually put on my radar, mm -hmm. and it is now Fleabag. Mm -hmm. um, controversial show, controversial themes. Um, this one is, I want to say, Amazon or Netflix? Which one is it? I'm not sure. But it's definitely it's not definitely, network. Yeah, it is not network because it's not the network. content is not network. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who is the star and I want to say like write, produce, like she, she and is she won the show. for most of those, including yeah. Best Actress. And this is Hello. like her first big foray, and she just swept. She she spent oh. half of the Emmys on stage. Yes. So if you're not sure who I talked to, just look back at the Emmys and the woman You'll who kept her. showing up on stage with a statue in her hand. That's her. That's her. Um, <laughs> a beautiful British accent, which of course oh, could know. win anybody over anyway. Yep. Um, <laughs> Bill Hader won for Barry, yep. his, his, his show. Repeat. Yep. Yeah. Which yeah, I still need right. to see. That's on my list too. I think that I'll tackle that this summer. And, and I think the problem is that there's so much to show that it's really hard to keep up, even with shows that you've been watching and have new episodes of. Yeah. I, my um, Never mind shows I DVR. Right, now right. I've got all the streaming services. And my DVR looks like oh. the percentage is going to say, we only go up to 100%. Yeah. Stop. Turn it to 11. <laughs> yes. Um, a personal favorite actress of mine, and I know this is also, you either like or you don't, Jane Lynch, mm -hmm. won for Best Guest Actor in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, yep. which I think is... A fabulous show that you introduced me to yep and totally won me over I couldn't stop watching 
And another personal, personal favorite that I hoped and predicted, Michelle Williams, one lead actress for Fosse Verdon playing Gwen Verdon yep. in a Which limited series. Was, I mean, there was so much hype and it was so well-deserved. So many people who knew Gwen Verdon said, this is it, this is her. I, I, I think we saw this one coming and we're okay with it. Sometimes we see them coming and we're like, ugh. And this was on network television. Yeah. I think Which might, even, maybe like the one, one out of like three network television wins. It was a rough night for it, network. It was. And that's why this was so exciting. But as I'd said before, Fosse Verdon, when you watched her, you thought you were watching Gwen Verdon. Mm -hmm. That's hard because this is not an actress that was unknown. Mm -hmm. She was known for multiple generations of viewers. And it, the fact that you could melt into her character, that says a lot about her acting talent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so excited for two in particular that you, you, I've talked about these shows like 400 times and it's okay. RuPaul <laughs> won for best host of a reality competition show or reality show. And V1, the only Emmy and Os no, Emmy Tony. and Tony winning Billy Porter for best actor in a drama for Pose. Which if you have not started watching yet, you are doing yourself a disservice. One of the best shows I've ever seen in my life, ever, period. And this is another one that I hear people are very polarized about. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I, it's a very specific experience that a lot of people don't relate to. I started watching it because I have taken Rachel's <laughs> suggestions more than once. And I have to say, I, I am... I am intensely glued to the subject. Um, it takes place at a time I was alive, mm -hmm. at the age of the actors that they're supposed to be then. Um, it's about in the 80s mm -hmm. and AIDS, but it's a group of people um, that I was not aware of. It was the, 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 the ballroom, scene. The ballroom yeah. scene. Um uh Basically, men who identified as women for, for the part most it, part. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of for the some experience, of it, that's true. Yeah, for some. There's one thing that I like about it is that there's so many different experiences, and so it's various gender identities and sexualities, and 95% of the principal cast is actors of color, which yes. you just don't see on network TV, really. And and the other thing I think that is really special about it is it really introduces how uh, those in the 80s in this particular community were so marginalized mm -hmm. in, in such a horrific way that they had to create their own family units mm -hmm. away from their yep. blood relatives because their blood, re blood relatives for the most part, not completely, did not accept them yet. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it's this fascinating combination of devastation and triumph and dark comedy and light comedy and romance and it's the second season for me um, which just ended a couple of months ago is even better than the first which I didn't think was possible and it's like the first season really introduced you and laid the groundwork yes. for the second season which hit where frankly hit you hit you where it hurts a couple of times yes with real emotional trauma that these characters experienced and um, once again, you will find this on the streaming networks mm -hmm. as opposed to on regular TV. My thoughts keep going back to when is network television going to get the message yeah. that if they want to keep making the money, they're going to have to start loosening the um, censorship issues. Well, and, then, and then I wonder sometimes And whether... I don't even know why I should be calling it that because yeah. that shouldn't even be a part of it. But it no, really but it's, is. It's, it is. Well, and you wonder if at this point networks just have to accept we're not going to win awards, but we're still getting the sponsorship. We're still getting. So maybe they just TV in those two different formats serves two different functions. Network TV is that makes where sense. family viewing occurs that. most of the time still, I think. There, there most are, of the time, yes. There I are see some shows on Netflix and Amazon and things like that that are family shows. But I think you're still going to find most family viewing occurs on network television. But even children's programming has a has a really active audience now in the pay 
That's true. channels. Disney Plus is coming out soon, and all of the Disney shows are going to be And Sesame there. Street is now an HBO show. Oh, I didn't realize that. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it does yeah. repeats on network TV, but it's an HBO show on first run. Wow. Um, so we just have to start seeing what the networks do and how they cope. Maybe they're just going to say, okay, we won't get awards. Yeah. But we get audience. Yeah, exactly. So maybe they go for the audience and let the <laughs> let the streaming networks fight for the for, for the accolades and the awards. It, and, it's but in my mind, you say the accolades, yeah. the awards, and the quality. Yeah. Because I think they're getting those awards for the most part deservedly. Whether I agree with the choices is not my my place. Yeah. But I think there's quality that is there. The problem is, who has time to watch it? <laughs> I don't. I don't. During the school year, no way. I mean, literally, if I watched everything that was nominated, I would have never left my house, eaten a meal, or had a phone call. <laughs> yeah. Ever. Maybe we should go to the cave where the Game of Thrones viewers who haven't finished the finale are. Yeah, yeah, there we we'll go. We'll go there. We'll set up our own little TV cave. <laughs> okay. Okay. The Carolyn Talks Television Cave in process. <laughs> and See, no, we're not is... setting up a GoFundMe. <laughs> no, no. Do, do not. not, <laughs> not, not do happen. not Venmo us. We okay. <laughs> now we can hit the 90s. And family the 90s. viewing. Yes. The 1990s where family viewing happened and you were in the family. Yes. You were Finally. part of those. So... <laughs> I have to still start, I'm sorry, because there's a couple of shows that, for me, really shaped the 90s. Mm -hmm. And I really think shaped a lot of interesting things that happened with what I would call borderline cult attitudes towards TV. Mm -hmm. um, started before we had streaming. Yeah, started this fandom approach. Yes. Yep. Friends. Mm -hmm. I would say Seinfeld. Oh, the, the jokes are still to this day. Um... I would say Saved by the Bell has oh a gosh. cult following, oh my God, that they're talking about, now years they're doing it years. again. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of these shows that you're going to be hearing about are experiencing rebirths right now, too. That's right. 90210. Yep. Hello, just was reborn, yep. and in a very amusing way, but reborn anyway, and yep. they're sort of like making fun of themselves is kind of what I called it. It, it was like this campy, bizarre. It's a campy, reality slash fictionalized show. It's blurring boundaries in a way that's kind of cool. It, it is. It is. And I hope they get recognized at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and there was something about children's TV that took an interesting turn. And parents, these are all shows that, by the way, families watched. This wasn't niche markets. This wasn't, you know, something that was on mm -hmm. the 30% the that had cable. This was on people's network TVs. And you had a show, some shows on a certain channel oh, yeah. you wanted to share with. The, the 90s for me was the Nickelodeon era. I mean, I, 90s started, I was five years old. So I started in the morning with all the Nickelodeon cartoons. That's right. And then they had Nick at Night, which was for my parents. <laughs> but then on the weekends <laughs> we had TGIF and we had all these. Nickelodeon for me, all that was like the flagship show. And I know they've rebooted it and I think they're actually trying to reboot it again for 2019. This show launched careers. It launched Amanda Bynes. It launched Kenan Thompson. And it launched a few people who went on to other shows and became really recognizable for my era. For me, th this was the time that Nickelodeon, and I watched with my daughter. Yeah. It took, um, really took off. Not only took off, but it created shows like Disney had created shows in the 50s and 60s yes. yep. that were worth reinventing yep. decades later and Absolutely. that's what we're seeing now well and all that was kind of like the saturday night live of for, for children kids. it was a sketch comedy show then there's that's right keenan and kel yeah. which came from all that then you also had clarissa explains it all you had so many shows that you were watching on nickelodeon then you had double dare and all of these other competition shows guts global guts i could still sit and watch these to this day and they all really started around the same like 1990 to 1995 time frame. Although Keenan and Kel, I think, was 1996 because it was a spinoff. But, but what I happened was there. Nickelodeon, um, like many children's shows are today, and, and very wisely so, really wrote to a multiple aged audience. Yep. They would say a joke that 
may or may not resonate mm -hmm. with a child. But that's because it resonated with the yep, child's exactly. mom and dad. Yep. They got the joke. And there, and there was just a variety. And even, even for being in the 90s, it was a very diverse show. Yes, it was. The characters were diverse. Even, I'm just thinking all that specifically, so many different demographic groups are represented on that show. That's true. And then the spinoffs from it, Pete and Pete was another one that was so good. Um, I still remember watching, I, I liked game shows. I liked game shows as a child, watching them mm -hmm. with my own mom and grandmother. So when Nickelodeon created a game show oh, yeah, that concept, was and they showed it in the afternoons, they didn't show it while the kids were in school, they, they scheduled things so that a parent could watch mm -hmm. with a it child. It started at like 3.34. And then those were like some of the smaller game shows and cartoons. And then by like five, six. Then you had the Double Dare yeah. and all these shows. To and this day, I want to go on Double Dare. If Double <laughs> Dare came back, I am applying. <laughs> and it launched careers. Um, I, I, his, his name escapes me, but the host of that oh, show. Mark Summers. Thank you, yep. Mark Summers. He went on to host like a million other, other oh, things yeah. after that. He hosted things on the Food Network. Yep. He became a host all over the place yep. that was very visibly recognizable. Yeah. So when he did show up, for example, on the Food Network later, I remember my daughter saying, oh my God, that's the guy <laughs> yep. that hosted Double Dare. Yep. And I'm thinking, okay. So there was really an influence here and I yeah. remembered it and she remembered it and you remember it. And oh, we yeah. can all, we remember watching with our children. It was fun and more, um, more wacky and a little less network-like. I have to admit, it yeah. was also taking a step away from network style. Um, it wasn't a sitcom, necessarily. Now, they, they, there wasn't a lot of episode to episode connection. They were all like little vignette, like quick 30 minute vignettes in the life of these characters. Right. There wasn't a lot of follow through, but that I think really suits kind of a young child audience. <laughs> They don't necessarily have the attention span or the ability to follow that. And I think even some of the um, tweens, yeah, what we would call Absolutely. the tweens watching with parents, it made it easy also for parents to watch with their child and feel comfortable about what they were seeing and not also want to go to sleep while they were watching with their child's choice. Yep. It made it amusing for me to watch. I was not like, oh my God, I'm going to have to watch that show with my daughter tonight. It was like, oh. That exactly. cute show is on. Okay, you ready? It's going to be on at 8. Let's make sure it's going to be on at 7 or 6, and let's make yep. sure dinner is done, or we'll have dinner right after. Yep. It, it was about seeing that together, because while we did have VCRs, we didn't have DVRs, and we didn't always want to tape everything. Watching things live was still yeah. um, important. Mm -hmm. People still talked about shows the next day, and you didn't want to rely on watching your VCR recording. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, we talked about some of the fandom approach with other shows. I do think Nickelodeon also did a really good job marketing and being at, you know, this town festival or having like the slime parties. I remember being at a mall and Nickelodeon was there and we got to put our feet in slime. And that's the yes. slime became this symbol for Nickelodeon. It was a part of the, the Nickelodeon for Kids logo, That's right. still to this day, Nick That's Jr. Right. sometimes, That's right. and it just, I don't know what, like they just did a really great job of marketing to a younger audience. And you know, it's interesting, I remember back um, when my children were younger, and this was during this time period, we actually took a trip to Orlando oh, and God. visited so for cool. just uh, one day, we visited back then, Universal was like this, mm -hmm. you know, Disney was growing, but Universal was still sort of mm -hmm. taking its baby steps. Um, and one of the things we, we visited was the Nickelodeon studio. Oh. Um, I wanted to go there so bad. They showed and, and it all so the we time. Watched, we, you know, we got <laughs> to watch people and they would pick people from the audience who volunteered to be part of the slime mm -hmm. example and yep. play a mock game of Double Dare. It wasn't the real show, yep. of course. Um, but it was something that we could all understand because we'd all watch together. Yep. That Absolutely. was truly a family viewing. Um, another uh, thing that happened in the 1990s was you had some of the sort of 
more left of center shows started showing up. Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, yes. I believe, was a 1990 show. By the incomparable Joss Whedon, who, again, has made so many phenomenal yes. fandom shows. True. And you want to talk about a fandom, Buffy the Whedonverse, which is the combination of all of his different shows kind of existing within the same universe. Buffy, I think, is a keystone yes. show. Oh, absolutely. And it spawned oh Angel, my gosh. short-lived Angel. But right. it's not, you know, it, it's one of those shows that the nerd community that I ascribe to <laughs> still holds very dear. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, without question, because I still get online and see people who refer um, to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there, there's, uh, I mean, it went to the big screen and big screen back and forth to the small yeah. screen. I mean, all this happened. And then another show, once again, when I say left of center, I mean really far left, uh, Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm was in the 90s. What an odd series. To me, this was sort of the beginning of where you got um, the, for lack of maybe the 12 episode series that we started seeing on um, HBO's and Showtime's. Mm -hmm. This gave license to them saying, oh, so something like that might work. A one season kind of show. Mm -hmm. And let's yep. see where it goes. And we have really weird characters like log ladies and a guy who goes and has his cup of coffee and pie on every episode. And just yep. and they're solving a murder that we see right from the start. But everybody's a little bit strange. And they're all part of the community. Mm -hmm. It's sort of also the beginning of seeing that different is not a bad thing. Different yeah. is just different. Quirky. There were, yes. there were more quirky characters, I think, in the 90s. That like The 90s quirk was so huge. I mean, you talk about Saved by the Bell and Screech. And these yes. characters that were just a little like, mm, but we started to see them more and more, I think, as the comic relief yes. or as the that character that you always kind of wondered about. Yeah. <laughs> Home Improvement was that era. Oh, yeah. Tim Allen. Oh my gosh. I loved that show. That show was great. Um, I also I think very much love Jonathan Taylor Thomas, which is probably you, you, why I watched that you show. You and every I single. I knew nothing about tools. I've still, I don't know nothing, anything about tool time. I don't think they did either. <laughs> that was what was <laughs> so funny. Fair. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> but, but the characters, once again, oh everybody gosh. had their quirk. Yeah. And I think they did a really good job of casting those shows. So there was someone from a variety of generations that the that's people watching at home thinking. had someone to connect to. And guess what? This was also the era that George Clooney's biggest start show, he had more than one start. We've seen him on other oh, yeah. shows he when was he was younger. The Killer Tomatoes um, when he was like his But this movie. was when ER was finishing its run was the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. And when he finished ER, George Clooney became George Clooney. Yeah, he went from George Clooney to and, and of yeah. course, we all know that superstar and George is George Clooney is the definition. Absolutely. Of a superstar. Even when he hasn't been in things for a while. It doesn't matter. The second he's in something, attention. Like everyone's paying attention. And you to know it. it's going to be something special. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was the night, the hallmark of TV shows, and I think sort of had its swan song in mm -hmm. the 1990s were the theme songs associated with TV shows. I still remember so many of them. I mean, we started with Friends, the Rembrandts. I mean, the theme from Friends, oh my God, I can't. I mean. There is an entire meme on TikTok, uh, social media, mostly used by teenagers at this point, not gonna lie, where people tape themselves trying not to clap to the theme song. <laughs> Um, the, the songs from Full House, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was the 1990s. In West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground, dot, 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 et cetera, et cetera. My, my students again, who were not alive, who were not born until 2002, know that theme song. And, and more major stars built yeah. from that show. Oh my gosh. Will that, Smith, are you, another superstar. Uh, without question. Um, without like, question. Can carry an entire movie on his back. And is right now carrying a new movie, Gemini, in two roles playing himself as a younger yeah. version clone. I mean, yeah. I, I don't even know how. <laughs> that's where talent is. Yeah. That's, that's how you mark talent. 
but all these shows had significant theme songs. They all had words, Saved by the Bell, um, Cheers, all of them had mm -hmm. significant theme songs, and that was really the finale of the theme song. Because I, really I when we go into in the 2000s, we're not gonna see that. We might see a tone or a slight tune, yeah. but it's, no. It's rare, or they would show it just the one time to introduce the show, and then they would only do like tiny abbreviated versions after that. And I, I too, I miss the theme yeah. song. I miss being able to sing with it. Yeah. I have to be honest. I mean, me and my voice took a leap in our own home and my oh, daughter absolutely. would sing and even my husband would sing some of them and he doesn't even watch TV <laughs> hardly at all, but he knew them. Absolutely. And, when, and I mean, when I was talking about Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. There's something that happens when someone starts singing that song where everyone around joins in and there's this like joyful feeling of like yeah i'm cool like will smith that's right <laughs> that that's right i don't know it's, hey. and it was wrapped which was not common on tv at that you point you know the anyway, the either. only you know i i think about theme songs we've known all all our lives and that was really the finale to it and it's a sad finale because i think it gave a kick to it that made it also family friendly yeah. When there's a song you can sing, whether it's more serious show or less serious show, it sort of brings everybody together. I know that sounds crazy and sort of cheesy, but I think no, it's I true. Think, I think it is true because you, like, when I would go on road trips with my family, they, I would be in the back of the car and we'd be naming that tune to theme songs. There you go. Well, next time we're going to be doing all the 2000s. We're not separating the last two. Last Next week is, next week, next month <laughs> is our, well, wishful thinking, is our final episode in this series. We will be doing all the 2000s to date that we consider family viewing. And it's much more hard to find truly family viewing, by the way. Yeah. We've been looking especially into new, it. Especially new family viewing. There's yes. There's a lot of repeats. Repeats, but, but the yeah. new ones. So, Rachel, thank you for another great show. Thanks, guys. Thanks and for thank you in. all for watching Carolyn Talks Television. <laughs> <laughs>